When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Sean Hackett. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida. He's nice enough to come on and talk about what's happening in the world of the commodities. Sean, how are you doing this morning? Doing really good. Coming off my 27-year anniversary uh, weekend. So uh, excited to be back and um, and go for another 27 years. So. Well, that's good, man, because I always tell my wife after 20 years we have to re-sign a contract. To get back, get things back, you know, hand back up, and she doesn't, she doesn't see the humor in it as much as I do. Well, somebody asked me uh, how long you've been married, uh, you know, down in the Keys, and I and I said I did this, and they and they said what's that? I said too long. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on, man. Needless well, congratulations. To say, needless to say, the bruise from. <laughs> the punch that I got for my wife is still uh, healing right now. Still healing. You so, still kind of use your arm yeah. a little bit. Yeah. 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 Come, getting full range of motion back. Yeah, that's good. That's <laughs> a good. little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Well, congratulations, man. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening here. Let's talk about what we see right now. So we got the USDA report coming out. Uh, is it next week, right? Uh, yeah, next week. Next week, yeah. So, I think it's next week. Yeah, I think it's like Tuesday or Wednesday, maybe. Um, Tuesday, sometime next week, we've got the USD report coming out. We're going to see uh, some stuff happening there. We're seeing some some uh, reports as far as what yields look like come out, slightly below what USDA predictions had. But um, you saw the Federal Reserve talk about, hey, we're not raising rates this time. We're going to keep rates the way they are, but we probably will raise another quarter percent somewhere this year, and we'll probably – do that and then just had this long-term uh, hold on interest rates out there. It's kind of got the market a little bit, a little bit shuffled for whatever reason. People thought that they were going to have some kind of reversal of uh, interest rates here, but uh, obviously uh, Chairman Powell has no interest in doing that. So I guess as you look at those factors playing into what you see happening in the marketplace, Sean, what do you see happening out there? First of all, it's October 12th. Uh, October so I don't think 12th. it's next week. It's the, I think it's the week after. Week after. But, uh, okay. There we go, yeah. I mean, so far, you know, and this is not, I, I wouldn't say this is a scientific uh, study that I've done, but in, from what I've been hearing from different customers throughout the Midwest, um, their yield relative to last year uh, relative, it, you know, is coming in slightly uh, below USDA numbers. Um, not dramatically so, but it would suggest that, you know, that we have maybe have a little further to go on yields to the downside. Um, you know, I'd make comment. I think on your show last time, you know, 170 ish and maybe 48 ish. I think those numbers are about right but with what I'm hearing so far. I mean, the, the harvest is a, is a ways to go before we get all the numbers out. And But nonetheless, I, I still think the crops are going to get a little smaller here in October. And, you know, maybe the markets might rally a little bit ahead of that expectation. You know, sometimes the, the, you get some short covering, that sort of thing. In terms of the Federal Reserve, I think the reason why the market's mm -hmm. getting very nervous is because thirteen trillion dollars of the U.S. debt is has to be rolled over over the next year, and if it rolls over at the higher interest rates, our interest expense cost as a percent of our, of our budget and as a percent of incoming tax revenue is going to skyrocket. Um, 
and 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 potentially reach twenty to twenty five percent of our tax revenue. And if that's the case, then the deficits that we currently have are, are going to get even worse because we have that much less money to actually spend because it's being used just to pay interest payments. When you look at the corporate bond market, corporations, a lot of corporations issued a lot of debt when interest rates were near zero. And you know a lot of that debt, uh, the first tranche of that debt is coming uh, due for rolling over, you know, meaning, meaning, you know, reissuing. So many of these companies, if they have to roll over at a higher interest rate, are insolvent. They are bankrupt. You know, their their business model only worked correctly if they were if they kept that low cost of capital. So if they are forced to roll over at a, at a higher interest rate, lots and lots of bankruptcies. And we're starting to see those bankruptcies, by the way, start to accelerate here. But in 2024, they're going to really go through. They're going to go up parabolically because there's just no way to service the debt for many of the business models that had 10 years of basically free money that everyone just got used to the fact that money was free. And now that it's not free, the business models don't work. So, so all this, you know, suggests that there's a lot of headwinds to the economy that ultimately, you know, should necessitate the federal reserve easing back, you know, mortgage rates, mortgage rate applications, uh, mortgage applications are at the lowest level since 1996. So what you have is you have people that are own their home, own their home with a 3% mortgage rate. They're not going to sell because if they sell, they have to buy a new house at the higher interest rate. They're not going to do it unless they have to sell. Buyers who have to borrow money aren't going to pay the, the higher interest rates. So they're not willing to buy. The only people that are buying anything are cash buyers. Um, so, you, so you have a really strange situation where you, know, you, you, you just have the situation where we have this cost of capital – that's the highest it's been in over ten years, fifteen years, and the and, and the and the the U.S. economy is just trying to adjust to how, how do we operate because everybody that's in place uh, in in most corporations management teams haven't been in a high cost of capital environment. They've been only in a zero cost of capital environment. So, so I you know I know what the Fed Reserve is doing. I know they're tr- they're trying to make sure that they uh, that the inflation rate uh, you know gets completely next, but they got to be very careful, Casey, not to uh, to overshoot this. Remember, it's election year, two thousand twenty four. Politicians are going to spend record amounts of money, handing free money to everybody to get the vote. We know this happens every single election yeah. year, and my view, and this is just my speculation, is. Chairman Powell looks like he wants to go out as an inflation fighter, a successful inflation fighter as his legacy. The politicians don't want to hear it. What they want to hear is that they can continue to spend money. The only way they can continue to spend money is they have to print the money, buy the bonds, and lower the interest rates. And I think if he's not willing to do that, they're going to give him an offer and he can't refuse to go spend more time with his family. Uh, because his family, <laughs> right. you know, has been deprived yeah. of, his, of of his time so much because of his devotion to the Federal devotion. Reserve, yes. um, that he needs to spend more time for the good of his family, and that they want to bring somebody in who's willing to put the printing presses on and lower rates and do exactly what the government wants them to do. Um, so if he's not willing to do that, and I don't think he is willing to do that, then he's going to go out, and they're going to bring somebody in who's can't wait to do that. And I think mm-hmm. that's an important um, dynamic. Uh, to watch as we get past December. I think that's when heads start to roll. Politicians are looking at what's coming and either the, either Chairman Powell's back on board with uh, playing the game or they're going to find someone to do it. Either way, monetary policy in 2024 should be decidedly different than it's been the last two years where I, I believe we're going to see money printing, lower interest rates, more accommodative Fed, and we're going to start unwinding you know, a lot of the damage that these interest rates have been doing. And as a result of that, risk assets, which commodities represent and agricultural commodities represent, um, and risk capital are going to want to go into places that are re- well rewarded in a more accommodative monetary environment. And so that means, from what I see, a commodities 
probably have made a low here over the summer. And I think that, you know, the, the prospects for a, a general upward commodity trend into 2004 looks very good. And if I'm even half right about my El Nino Modocai delivering an extremely unfavorable uh, drought risks to the northern half of Brazil, especially Mato Grosso, that produces 70% of the corn and 60% of the soybeans, then you have a you, you have the, the monetary side and you have you know the, the 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 climate side working in your favor and then you know who knows with geopolitics but it wouldn't surprise me if geopolitics mm -hmm. decided to get involved and, and you could have you know a, 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 a significant unwinding of this extraordinarily bearish Armageddonish uh, commodity psychology we currently have, mm -hmm. which is China is going to implode. It's never coming back. The Federal Reserve is never going to stop raising interest rates. The dollar is going up forever. Um, you know, I mean, we, we, we're trading these extreme um, uh, psych psychological views about commodities, and usually that's when a bottom takes place and when the other side of the trade uh, starts to take place. And quietly, commodities have overall been rattling off the lows despite it all. So, And that's without any help from the dollar, without any help from the Fed, without, you know, we, you know so... So I, I just look at them, and to me, so everything about you know, farming, agricultural prices, risk management, price forecasting is 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 a prop is is weighing the probabilities of outcomes, right? Right now, when I'm looking at the probabilities of outcomes, the probabilities of outcomes are now strongly weighted in the favor of upside price risks, in my opinion, versus downside price risks. So. The way I'm viewing it is if you're on the buy side of these markets, if you're a cash buyer of corn, of bean meal, soybeans, of coffee, of sugar, you know, if you're on the buy side of these markets, you know, you need I think you need to be protecting protecting your risks to the upside, because to me that's where the risks um are right now, not the other way around. A year ago, it was exactly reversed. Everything was downside price risks were the were the biggest risk. And producers needed to protect those margins. We talked about on your show you know, week after week about, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Now we're on the other side. Of course, everyone's bearish now. Nobody wants to do that, but that's just the way market psychology works. So, so I really feel strongly that's where we're at. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a, uh, <clears throat> a lot of things going right now. It just feels like there's, you can cut the tension with a knife. It feels like, all right. I would agree as with you, that. As you take a look, uh, it's going on in Ukraine. So Russia hit another um, uh, port and grain facility on a port, right? They've been doing that for a while. No big deal there. Um, but it's getting to be a bigger deal because now it's getting to the point where um, they're getting, it's getting harder to get stuff out of the country. You've got um, Poland and Romania and some other bordering countries of Ukraine that are saying, hey, you know, enough with the grain thing. We're going to stop supporting you and getting getting weapons to you and those kind of things because you basically you're flooding our market with grain and it's ruining our grain our grain uh, our commodity markets and we're trying to <clears throat> trying to keep our farmers happy you've got that you got a few more ships coming out of the black sea still just a trickle i mean there's not hardly it's not like a big big mover at all but sean as you take a look at all those things that are happening right now it's like taking one step forward and five steps backwards when you start looking at you know how these how the Ukrainians are are handling getting their grain where it needs to go and the pressure that's come along with that. As you look at those scenarios, Sean, what do you think the grain, if anything, has a grain complex built that in? Are they is that, are they kind of is it a wait and see thing right now that you're looking at? I mean, what what kind of what kind of response are you looking for from the grain market that are the these um, uh, Ukrainian issues that we see that are going to move the grain market sometimes some. some in some great way. Well, the the current view is it doesn't matter. Right. Oh, yeah. Because the That's price, true. the price of wheat, the price of SRW is what six dollars five ninety down from yep. fourteen. So it just doesn't matter because Russia has been willing to sell every bushel they have at a, the lowest price in the world to anybody who's a buyer, and they've and they've continued to be willing to do that. Now exports out of uh, out of um, Ukraine last month were down fifty two percent from a year ago. So the supplies of the Ukraine are down, but as long as Russia is hitting the bid on their sales, the market is saying, who cares? But I don't believe that the uh, that Russia is going to continue to do that. Now, that's my speculation. I can't – I don't have anything that says it'll end tomorrow or the next day. But when I look at the overall 
picture of actual ending stocks in the top uh, six exporters of wheat in the world relative to the demand for that wheat, we're at 35-year lows. Now, that hasn't mattered because Russia is just selling. Uh, but given that we are getting off to an incredibly bad start to the planting season for winter wheat in both Ukraine and Russia, very, very dry weather, very unfavorable um, conditions for planting the wheat crop, for getting it to, to establish itself, for getting good stands going to dormancy. Um, it suggests that the weather risks go you know, for the next crop cycle are going to be very, very high, meaning we're going to get, get this crop off to a terrible start. It's going to go into dormancy in terrible condition, and it means that the risks for a poor crop come the springtime are extremely elevated. And that's a dangerous place to be when the only – country that's keeping the wheat market down is Russia. So I, you know, I kind of feel that once again, that complacency we have is so, so pervasive right now that that's typically when the market makes a low, when everybody absolutely positively thinks geopolitics are not going to be an issue for the foreseeable future. Now, a year and a half ago, everybody thought we we're going to $20 a week because, you know, the geopolitics was never going to end. We're exactly on the opposite side of that pendulum. And yes, it's been frustrating. And yes, the market has stayed lower for longer than many of you thought, including myself. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, that the upside price risks have changed. It doesn't mean that uh, the complacency is going to last forever. It just means that this is a dangerous place. If you're in the business of buying wheat, if you're a country that needs to import wheat, if you're a company that needs to buy wheat, this is a dangerous place not to get yourself covered to the upside and protect that risk, which to me looks to be very, very high that at some point that uh, card is going to shift to something more worrisome. And if we put weather premium on and geopolitical premium on uh, at the same time or, or, or fairly close to each other, um, and, and with a record short position of speculators in the wheat market, you know, it, it, the, the kind of short covering that that could cause, Casey, in a panic, you know, certainly would, would, would provide some potential for some upside fireworks. And that's what I keep um, – that's what I. That's what I feel is the biggest worry here, and I'm and I'm really, really trying to convey to my customers and to my subscribers, you know, that that the wheat market looks prime for a change in the narrative, from nothing to worry about forever to holy shoot, these risks are real, they're back, and now what do we do? And that's that's where I feel we're at, and I would argue that the corn market, you know, would participate in that to some extent as well. So. All right, that makes makes good sense. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so question here I have for you: You look at August, and August was a was off in as far as uh, demand for pork and beef comparatively to years past. Um, probably a good signal that hey, you know what we do? We have some re recessionary things. The money's just not there that used to, that has been in there in the past for families. As you look at what it costs to, as you look at the uh, at the August trends. What are your thoughts there, and, and what do you think some of that could be as far as cold storage reports go? Well, you know, um, when I look at the cattle market, you know, there are actually quite a bit of uh, cattle on feed for the fourth quarter that need to come to the marketplace at a time that demand is showing signs of weakening finally for beef. Um, I think that could create some excess beef, at least short term. Um, and increase some of that cold storage uh, beef stocks that we haven't seen for a while. The the issue with the hogs is the margins have been so awful, record low margins at times this year. You know that the hog herd is starting to shrink, the weights are starting to shrink, the supplies are going to be shrinking, and if you looked at the uh, the uh, pork cutout prices, you know they've really started to surge, saying that even though demand has been weak, it's starting to actually pick up. People are finally trading down to the value uh, proposition of pork meat consumption versus expensive beef meat consumption. And so the prospect, and then of course you have the potential for African swine fever, meat protein shortage in China, bring lots of export demand or import demand from China for pork. You know, I, I think the prospects for 
Pork demand going into the fourth quarter and into the first half of 24 look pretty bright at this point. Beef, you know, it's going it, to, the demand I think is going to continue to erode away. Now, of course, you know, supply is, at least in the U.S., is very, very tight. We know that the prices have crashed in Brazil. We know that the prices have, for cattle have crashed in Australia. But in the U.S., they still remain tight. Um, so to me, you know, we look at what's called a 95% uh, logarithmic interval chart that goes back seven, uh, 50 years of price behavior, and it puts statistical bands on extreme highs and lows and how the market's behaved over that period of time. Um, and only two times have we reached that upper 95 percentile band or exceeded it. Uh, one was um, in the 1970s, and one was, of course, 2014. And each of those times you know, led to a pretty meaningful top over the uh, ensuing six months. Now, just because the price behavior has been that way for 50 years doesn't mean it can't diverge. But we try to go with probabilities. I just think when you are looking at the third most extended feeder cattle and live cattle market in 50 years in terms of price stretched to the upside, you have to be locking in the margin. You have to be protecting prices. Now, whether you do that with, with futures hedges, whether you do that with put options hedges, whether you do cash sales, you just have to, um, you have to protect that price because stranger things happen. Everyone says, oh, the price can't fall. The, 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 there's no supply. Demand's not going to, you know, we have all these things. It can't, it can't, it can't, it won't. We know in, in the history of futures, any such things that a market can't do something is erroneous. It can do anything it wants to do and it'll do something when you don't expect it to and it'll do something it surprises at the market and you don't want to be a woulda, shoulda, coulda. Well, I coulda, I shoulda, I woulda. Now what do I do? Now the price is down $20 off the highs, 20 cents off the highs. What do I do now? Um, I just think that's where you have to be in the cattle market right now. It's just not a market that you want to play games. The money on the table is too big to screw around. In my opinion, you got to protect and bring the money home on the farm. Does it mean you can't go for some more upside? Does it mean you can't hold some sales back, but get enough sold in case things surprise and all of a sudden we drop from, you know, 190 to 160 out of nowhere and you go, wow, I didn't see that coming and now I have to sell, you know? All right, man. All right. Uh, one last question. Looking out at the, um, your weather models going through the end of the year. Are you expecting a earlier than normal freeze this year? Or are you expecting things to kind of fall along what, what would be like a normal, normal time? It doesn't look like we're going to get that uh, Pacific typhoon mm -hmm. thing that we talked about where it can yeah. develop and go up and bring it down. It, it, it was just, it, we have not developed that. Gotcha. Um, it, I don't think so. I think we're going to have uh, normal freezes at the normal times that you would expect. Um, but no, I'm not expecting, um, based on what I'm seeing with the upper airflow pattern um, of these uh, and, and how the typhoon season has gone, it doesn't look like we're going to get that kind of pattern that historically has created the environment for for, a short, for an earlier than normal uh, frost in um, you know in in the U.S. It doesn't look doesn't not look promising. That's going to happen. It looks like we're going to get pretty normal frost dates. That, looks to me so gotcha and then from the el nino front are you still kind of in the same camp that you were a couple weeks ago yeah nothing's really changed with that el nino yeah. mordecai is going to develop by december january um certainly by january um it's going to peak um that you know i think we're going to have a a a, a, a winter that d is warm in december but very cold from january onward like we had two years ago right lots and lots of snow if you look at what happened last year, record snowfall out west. Yeah, we couldn't buy a yeah. snowflake. We couldn't buy a <laughs> snowflake in the eastern half of the country. Yeah, I think it was the low one, the lowest snowfall rate levels in whatever thirty years, whatever it was. It was just so record setting, no snowfall. This year, I'm expecting potentially record snowfall in many areas in the east of the U.S. We have a very warm Atlantic. We're going to have what we believe is an Alenio Mordecai develop, which means cold air is going to sit is going to be persistently central east, mm -hmm. whereas last year it was central west. 
So if you have a lot of moisture pumping off of warm Atlantic coming into cold air in the eastern half of the country, that's called a nor'easter. And right. they're, they're going to spin, and that means your southeast, mid-Atlantic, northeast, eastern half, we could see some epic, epic snowfall and winter-type conditions. The west always gets their snow. They're going to get, you know, the ski slopes are going to open up, but it's not going to be an epic situation out west. The epic nature of the winter is going to be shifted towards the east, kind of like what happened with the summer, where the dry west gave way to a dry central east grain belt. That's what we see for this year. And remember, when you're looking at the demand for natural gas, the demand for heating oil, diesel, they're much more impacted by a colder eastern half of the country than a colder and western half of the country. Meaning, if you had to pick your poison for what's more, uh, what increases demand for natural gas and diesel more, it's an eastern half cold winter versus a western half. So that means that markets like natural gas, markets like heating oil, could be particularly impacted by this particular snowy cold summer uh, winter. Uh, but it is going to be delayed. You know, we're not going to, you know, it's going to be more of a January onward. I want to be very clear about that. You know, I think we think December can be fairly warm. So it'll be a little bit of a delayed start to the winter. Um, we think overseas, it's just going to be cold all the way through. So. Okay. So when you're looking at the West, uh, are you talking like drought type situations, like no hardly any snow? Or are you talking like normal snow? El Nino Modicai means the West is deprived of, of moisture more so than not. Normally, an El Nino means a lot of Western moisture, okay? Normally. Right. So, an El Nino Mordecai, because, it, because it's the center of the Pacific, is where the warm water is, and on each side, it's colder. You, you lose your classical El Nino uh, walker cycle that drives moisture to the West. So, the West, because it's still El Nino, it doesn't mean the West is bone dry but it means that their precipitation should be well below what a normal El Nino would provide. So I'm not saying they're not going to get anything. I'm just saying it's it's not going to be anything what you would typically see in a normal El Nino pattern. Um, it's going to be on the drier side. You know, we're not going to we're not going to see epic snowfall like we saw last year. It'll be a lot. You know, I would say you know a lot of places <laughs> normal to below normal, but you know I'm not looking at dry weather like we had a few years back. Um, not in El Nino Motocai, okay. even 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 then, you still get better moisture. Now, we move to La Nina by the summer of next year, which is what our forecast suggests. We will move back to a neutral La Nina uh, construct by the summer of 2024 into the summer of 2025. That's where the West can go back to where it was in terms of that kind of epic dryness, but not this coming year. I think it's disappointing El Nino moisture, but not zero. Gotcha. All right. So I don't have to worry about, you know, three to four feet of snow again this year, like I did last year. <laughs> you're telling me. All right. Well, right. you know, we, we always tell everyone, you know, getting specific on exact geography is a little difficult. You know, we try to sure. get the, yeah. the broad picture correct. And I do think center, center east is going to be where the action is. And the more east, the more action. But I, I think where you're at, you know, on the more western side, I, I don't think you're going to be looking at epic snowfall for the most part. I think you'll, you know, not have that have that kind of a – the risks aren't high for that to happen this coming winter for you specifically. Right. Yeah. Boston, New York, Pennsylvania, you know, the mid-Atlantic states, the D.C., uh, you know, I, you could be looking at, you know, potentially record snowfall kind of stuff going on. That's, that's, what, that's where the high probability forecast we see – to make is, is is looking for epic snowfall um, more easterly this year than westerly. So right okay. All right, man. I think it's probably a good place to stop. Sean, if folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing over at Hacker Financial, what's the best way to do that? We have a we have a Twitter page at Faradex eleven. We have a LinkedIn page and we also have our website at Hackett H A C K E T T advisors.com where we're from time to time we talk about our weather cycles, mm -hmm. our um, different fundamental uh, statistics that we utilize to make our price forecast to see if how we do things and the way we look at the world and agriculture might be of value to your listeners. Right on. Go to his Twitter page there and you can slide into his DMs. That's something that's a hip, that's a hip term for you there, Sean. <laughs> All right. I, I got I to gotta stay current. I definitely want to stay, stay on top of Got to stay hip, things. man. Yeah. Got to stay hip. All right. 
I am Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast and go over and watch the video version of this heavily edited podcast um, over at uh, the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. I know it's shocking. It's very really shocking. Very well thought out name there. So check that out. Go to Moving Iron LLC for everything Moving Iron related. And uh, you can check all out all the good stuff there. Got a few announcements that will be coming up here. Pretty soon it'll be kind of a big deal, so check that out. Look, look for those. So uh, with that, I'm Casey Seymour, Sean Hackett, Smooth Smart folks. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century.